Are you struggling to find the right professional talent for your project? Are you working with a limited budget? We are so excited about our next sponsor, Casting Networks. I have personally used Casting Networks to release a number of projects for free to the industry's largest network of professional performers for my commercial work and for my very first short film, Strange Thing. Creators can manage submissions, schedule auditions, request and review self-tapes, and book top talent for their projects all in one place all for free. On Casting Networks, you can create an account and send your casting call to thousands of professional talent. So join Casting Networks, the industry's preferred casting platform where more than 1.2 million performers have scheduled over 14 million auditions. That's a lot of auditions. Visit www.castingnetworks.com slash movies to create an account for free today. You know, making movies is hard. Making movies is hard. Welcome. This is the podcast about the struggle of being an independent filmmaker. I'm Alark Purcell, the founding host of the podcast, and I'm a sci-fi horror filmmaker, and my first feature film, The Alternate, will be coming out on September 13th. I muted myself because my son is banging against the door. I am Liz Manichel. I'm a writer, director, producer who has made two features, Bread and Butter and Speed of Life, and I'm currently in development on about... 3,216 more. I'm a distribution consultant who does sales, and I used to manage Sundance's creative distribution initiative. Enough about me. This week, we have writer-director Anna Guteau on the show to talk about her first feature film, Paradise Highway, which comes out in theaters and streaming on Friday, July 29th, starring Morgan Freeman and Juliette Binoche. Anna talks about how she came up with the idea, how the film got made, and how she was able to make her first feature film at around a $6 million budget. After that, we talk about an article for from IndieWire about how two films aimed at older ladies did well at the box office. And lastly, Ulrich and I talk about intention and filmmaking. First, Ulrich, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Yeah, just what riding the waves of life, you know, as they go up and they go down. And now I suddenly want to be in the water actually riding waves, but I can't because I don't live near the ocean. Yeah, I don't know. I've been reading more scripts. <laughs> I read one. Oh boy. I fought tooth and nail to get to page 30. And I got there and I was like, I got it. I can't do it anymore. Not a good sign. And then I wrote a nice email saying that I couldn't. I gave a really brief description on why. And then I was like, if you want more feedback, let me know. And then the person was like, no, I do not want your feedback. Here's eight more ideas. Do you want to read any of these scripts? And I'm like, oh, do I roll the dice again? Could it possibly be better? And then like the the synopsis of one is like, oh, that's interesting. But it's like, oh, the other synopsis was good too. And the script wasn't good. So I'm like, ah. And I, I used Twitter yesterday, and I haven't even actually looked at it since, but I uh, I tweeted at you and a few other people, like, send me some scripts, and I haven't looked to see if anyone responded yet. That's how good I am at Twitter. <laughs> I could connect you to that writer that I met with a few weeks ago that I talked to you about. I mean, he is a repped writer. He's gotten some things optioned. He's a nice guy, and he does have a, at least one horror script, if you want to talk with him. Yeah, sure. I'll talk to anybody, anybody and everyone. I want to I want to hear. I want to be part of the I want to be part of the buzz. I want to be part of the, the, the machine. I want to be in the mix, you know? Uh, what's another catchphrase I can throw? I don't know. Yeah, what else? I, I, I kind of cooled off on my, my manager reach out. I have not heard back from anybody. But I still think it's a good thing to do, so I'm going to keep doing it. But yeah, I haven't really been doing much. No exciting news on anything. Keep on hearing things and then like sounding like, oh, well, I finally get the answer I've been waiting for on this project. And then all of a sudden, then nothing. No, you know, then it's like a big letdown. Like, oh, the meeting got canceled. Oh, the decision maker couldn't, couldn't be there. This other person loved it. But the person who had a flight that got canceled or whatever. It's like always something. So I'm just like, whatever, dude. Like, it'll, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I'll just wait until they say, until I get the word. I'm not going to, like, put a lot of weight and stock into it. But yeah, I'm like mentally getting myself ready to start writing again. That's like the thing. Like, just mentally preparing myself. So I don't have time right now, but like mentally getting ready. So when I, I do have time, I will write. Also, been watching lots of cool stuff. I watched the first five episodes of Resident Evil, which was really great. I don't know. Are you watching that on Netflix? No. What? <laughs> oh my God. I'm watching Dude. the rehearsal and the rehearsal only. And our flag means death. Those are like the most oh, important things to me. Oh, our flag means death is great. That's really fun. Yeah. I like that one. Rehearsal. I haven't heard of what's a rehearsal. Nathan Fielder, the, the love of my life. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. And I was like, there's puppets. What? People, oh, fake. There's no puppets oh, okay. in, in the pilot. It's amazing. All right. It is amazing. It's is amazing. It good? Do you, did you like Nathan for you? I watched a few clips. It was funny. I laughed. I chuckled. I, I was not a huge show fan of I didn't like watch all the episodes or anything oh I have uh, the DVD set behind me uh, <laughs> right there <laughs> um. 
I have the Summit Ice jacket. I I love Nathan for you. I love Nathan for you. Wow. So that makes sense why you'd love that. All right. Well, what's going on with you? Anything interesting? We have the COVID. I'm only saying that now because last <laughs> week I was like, ah, ha, ha, ha. I'm asymptomatic. My whole family's got the COVID and I'm in the clear. No, no, no. It caught up with me. I got the symptoms and I definitely have the COVID right now. It it It's horrible. And I'm, I think I only have a few more days to go. So that's great. But it really makes you appreciate leaving the house like so much. <laughs> like, I just really miss leaving the house. Other than that, I, I want to go back to what you were saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right after you finished the alternate, I think you said something like, I don't want to do what I did for the alternate again. I don't want to have to like, you know, put my heart and soul into a project and push it along. Like, I think there's this expectation once you get your first feature off the ground that <clears throat> things are going to be easier with the next project. And I yeah. also feel I felt that way, too. And I still still hold out hope that maybe Project 3 will be easier. But I, I feel like you and I had similar trajectories in that you push projects with um, outside partners, right? With like larger production companies and you pitch and you play the game and you play that lottery. But ultimately, you're still going to have to find the project that you have the most amount of control over that you're not waiting on other people for it to be made. Yeah. It sounds like you're in that moment right now. Yeah, I totally feel that way. And yeah. I think I, when the movie was first finished and I started getting to film festivals, I was like, maybe it won't have to be that way for me. Maybe I'll, you know, whatever, get skyrocketed to success. Everybody will want to have a water bottle meeting with me because I'm a new director person. But yeah, hasn't been that yet. Well, your film hasn't been released yet. But I'm just- I know, but I mean, <laughs> even when it's released, Liz, is it really going to happen? Is it really going to be that way? It like, am I going to get... I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Anyways. But I but your situation that you're describing, right? Like all of these reasons why something hasn't been pushed along, like I experience mm-hmm. that too on a daily basis. And that's what's so frustrating, right? It's so exhausting. Right. And that's why I've gone back. Like I'm still pushing those projects forward, but every week I'm always like, but the thing I know that's gonna happen is the thing that I have the most control over, which is probably this right. horror film. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on? I'm on page six. 17 of the horror film of the latest rewrite with Amy. So that's really great. We're close to the end of Act 1. Not really. We have quite a few more pages to the end of Act 1. But at least we're like past the first sequence. That's going well and feeling really good about it. What else? What else? For the sci-fi film, our producer did a breakdown of the whole script. And he's looking at whether it's going to be a 20 or 22 day shoot. He first did a 20 day breakdown. And I said, I would really like a few more days. And he said, well, I'd rather give you something than take things away. So why don't you think of the 20 day as like worst case scenario? But he went ahead and he did a 22 day breakdown. And we Mm. have a new deck. And I think I mentioned the deck. And then... We're going out with Thin Blue Veins, Josh's script, and to, with new production companies and new investors and things like that. So we're making progress bit by bit. I'm just trying to think there's anything like newsworthy. What's you, newsworthy? You, you, you use the phrase that so many people use that I, I always get annoyed at. Oh, what? We're, we're, we're going out with. We're going out. So we're going who out. are you going out to? How are you going out? Tell us the yeah. details. How is this happening? So we brought on... <laughs> going out. I have a, a teammate who's been on this show Tom Putnam he's like my he's my mentor pretty much and I'm on a bunch of projects with him because he's just lovely and kind and I like working with him and he's come on board Thin Blue Veins and so he's pitching a bunch of projects around town and so he's added Thin Blue Veins to those projects so he's going mm. out and then I've mm. thought of like there are a few producers and production companies I've been trying to get to so I, I'll send them queries with information okay. about Thin Blue Veins. Oh, cool. Nice. That's what That's I call awesome. going out. We're going out. Yeah. We're dating. I think when going out is like, I don't know. When I hear that, it's like, you know, you magically have 10 meetings at different production no. companies. No, it's like sending <laughs> emails. It's just like... <laughs> Okay, like, Please so I could say this. that I yes. could be like, I'm going out with my thing too. Yes. Nah, going out, nah. going out. <laughs> I, I feel like there's more, and this is not COVID brain fog, but I, I don't know. Are, are oh, I think 
This is the only other thing that I mentioned. I haven't talked about the collective filmmaking pod that I'm a part of that's going to be oh, making cool. this horror film next year is we're going to actually launch a Patreon. We're launching oh. a Patreon for development and we're going to bring all the Patreons into the fold to let them see or to be a part of all of our weekly development meetings, the building of our assets, the discussions we have about how we're going to do things differently. Like we're actually starting to build a community and we're going to probably launch that in September. So that's exciting. So that's on mm, the docket. Nice. Awesome. But I, oh, perfect segue. Those listening should really support our Patreon because we have a Patreon at the podcast, www.patreon.com slash MMIH podcast, because the Patreon for this podcast really keeps the show going. That and our new sponsor, the Casting Networks, who we love. Thank you, Casting Networks. Woohoo! But also, don't forget to check out Jambox.io, which is a new royalty-free music and SFX company with an emphasis on those high-quality cinematic cues. We'd like to share that they have customized plans to fit your needs, which is great. Use our code, capital M-M-I-H, to sign up for a 20% discount today. And without any more delay, here's our chat with Anna Gateau. All right, we're here with director Anna Guto of Paradise Highway. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First off, give us the elevator pitch for Paradise Highway. <laughs> it's been so long since I've done that now. You know, that's like years ago. But the elevator pitch for Paradise Highway is it's a story about a female trucker who uh, the only person she has in the whole world is her brother who's in prison. She's the only person she loves and, and he and yeah, he's the only person she loves. And he asks her to do these runs for her, these drug runs on the outside so that he can be protected on the inside. And this for this last run that she's going to do for him, it turns out the package is not drugs, but it's a young girl, this young girl called Layla. So suddenly our truck driver finds herself in this situation where she has to decide whether to save her brother's life and take this girl or refuse to take this girl. And, you know, it's, it's just about transporting this girl, she tells herself, and she chooses to take the girl along. How many days did you shoot? Our schedule was 25 days. Um, we had a situation that happened during the shoot that made us get some insurance days. So all in all, it became 28. But it wasn't really three more days because it was lost time during the shoot. So it really was a 25 day shoot. And then we had two days of shooting with drones a couple wow. of months later. And what was the rough budget, if you can say? You know, I, I'm actually, I actually don't know exactly where that ended up, to be honest with you. But I, I believe that the net was around six or six, five. Wow. Yeah. How did the idea come about? How was it originated? I mean, it's interesting with that question because I feel like a story like this, it, it evolved over so many years and then... Uh, and it also, it has several originating ideas kind of coming together into one. And that's kind of what makes it a full kind of rich, you know, one hour and 45 minutes. But it, I guess I would say that sort of seed for it came from the situation that happened that I, when I was a teenager, where at a certain point it became, it had come out that in my friend's building, there had actually been a brothel. And I just remember it as this kind of mind blowing situation that happened and that I, that I just realized how trafficking really under, happens right under our noses. And it, sort of, and it stayed with me. And obviously that's many years ago, but this thing stayed with me, the fact that these things happen right under our nose. And then I was a foreign exchange student in Indiana at one point, and then I lived in New York for many, many years, and then in LA. And, and, and then seeing also, you know, seeing young people clearly not being in the situation they wanted to be and realizing how trafficking is happening all around us. And then, you know, as I became a filmmaker, as I went from theater into film, this story really became something I wanted to make something that had to do with trafficking and that shed light on the fact how it's happening under our nose. And then from there, it's, you know, I was, I was in class at Columbia and one semester I happened to have Paul Schrader, who's an amazing filmmaker, obviously, who did 
you know, taxi driver, etc. And and he and and by that point, the story had evolved into this girl sort of being at truck stops, etc. And he said to me, it was like, you know, Anna, I saw this YouTube video of this female truck driver. I feel like there might be a character in there somehow for your movie. So I started looking at and researching female truck drivers. I got to know a bunch of female truck drivers, and especially this one woman, Desiree Wood, who has a trucking network called Real Women in Trucking. And she invited me into these conference calls with female truckers. So I was sitting in my tiny apartment in New York and, you know, her, she and like all of these other female truckers were all over the country, everything from like Maine to California to Alaska, also Canada. And I would just listen in on their conversations for hours and hours. They would share advice of the road with each other, advice on how to deal with, you know, the the fact that they're in such a male dominated industry. We would be and, and they would be talking about their lives, like why they had chosen a life on the road. And and I gained so much respect for this way, these women. And, and and also just I was so in awe of the choices that they had managed to 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 make in their life than the choices they had managed to take. And 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 so with that and with all of this research I had started doing on trafficking, a story started to form. And then in the middle of all of this, I was I, I gave birth to my first child. And I was feeling the trepidation of becoming a mom, but also the joy of becoming a mom. And then that started really infusing itself into this story that deals with with human beings being disconnected and finding a way to connect. So from there, it really started to take form into the story that it is today. And so how long did you spend working on the film from like writing the first draft to it being released, you know, now? So I I started developing the story when I was pregnant with my first son. And then I wrote the first draft right after he was born. And he is turning 10 in October. Oh, wow. That's amazing. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. But obviously, I mean, I've done many things in between there. I did that Netflix show and I've done, you know, short films and had writing assignments, you know, a lot of different things in between there. But this has been my absolutely top priority throughout those 10 years other than my kids, you know. <laughs> well, this question is tied to all that compared to all those projects, that maybe not child rearing, but all the other professional mm. projects you've taken a part of. Can you compare the difficulty level of this one uh, to those? It's hard to really compare because this is a feature film that's, you know, it's my script and it was going to be, you know, it's become my first feature. So it's difficult to difficult to compare because, you know, a short film just is a lot easier to do the same with sort of coming in and doing part of the directing of a TV show for Netflix. It's 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 just so much easier because everything is already set up. And obviously one of the huge challenges with this movie was to get the movie to happen because that's just incredibly, incredibly hard when it's the first feature. So so it's hard to even compare because it's just such a different animal. This being your first feature, can you talk about like how you were able to get such a large budget for your first film? Like and like how did it did it start as as being like around six million or was it like much smaller originally and then it grew larger as the project went on? Like can you just talk us through how that all played out? Yeah, it definitely started smaller. And initially I was hoping to make it for a lot, lot less. But being a film that has a lot of the action taking place in not just a driving vehicle, but an 18-wheeler driving vehicle, it became quite clear to me, you know, for several years ago, it became clear to me that this is not something I'm going to be able to do on like an ultra low, just just do it with your friends type of way, because there is just no way of doing that safely with 18 wheelers. So, so, so that, that became clear. So then I was told by, I don't know how many I was told by that there was just no way that I was going to get to direct this movie because it's a movie that has, that's going to have a budget over 2 million. There's just no way you're going to get to direct this movie. So it was through that process and I got offers 
of selling the script, which I have to, you know, I have to say it was, it was tough to kind of go through and really process that. But I'm glad I came down on the decision of not doing it and just holding to that. No, this is the, you know, this is a film that I'm going to direct. And I'm just convinced that it's going to happen somehow. But then even, you know, even when I got the producers on board who ultimately made the, you know, got the movie to come together, even when they came on board, we certainly were looking at lower budgets. But then it started growing with the cast a little bit more. And I I, I can't say now, but but I I know that we for a long time were looking at like a 3.5 budget. But I think the reality and that they also realized and kind of everyone involved in the project realized is that because of the trucks, because of the myriad of locations, it's just very hard to do this movie on on an ultra ultra low but obviously it it did also increase you know with with morgan freeman so so yeah it ended up quite a bit higher than it was supposed to or not supposed to but than it was initially at the same time it really would have been very difficult to make this particular movie on a much lower budget well- I wanted to ask about filmmaker impatience. Like we were in a culture of impatience with, especially with a lot of filmmakers who are being told over and over again, like pump them out, just make the movies. It's volume is important, you know, or, or whatever. I think a lot of us are being encouraged to just make the movie. And I really admire your patience and your conviction to do this film the right way. And I'm curious, did you have other scripts that you were thinking of making your first feature instead like to work your way up to the six million dollar or was it always just this one project well i mean again i i did not think it was going to be a six million you know i thought it was going to be lower just to just to make it clear that i wasn't i wasn't expecting that i would get (laughs) six million for my first feature in any any kind of way but but when it comes to no i didn't have other scripts I'm not a super fast writer. I'm kind of, you know, I'm a writer who does tons of research and I'm not one of those writers that can churn out a script every three months or every half year even, or even every year, something that's really, really good quality of a script. So when I made that choice, I was like, well, this is the script that I'm going to be able to get together to direct because this is the script that's good enough and that talent thinks is good enough and that people again and again are saying is a particularly interesting and has good characters and like this script is going to be made and this is sort of my chance of getting something made but when you say uh, patience i am not patient at all <laughs> And if I had been patient, it probably wouldn't have been made at all. I'm incredibly, I'm a very impatient person. So all of those like 10 years, not continuously because of other things I also took on to do, but pretty much throughout that entire time, I was being impatient and pushing and pushing on every little possibility, like every little avenue of pushing, inching things forward. I was doing continuously every day for all of those. I mean, not, you know, the first couple of years were about the writing and about finishing the script and the research and all of that. And that continued also. But once I sort of from 2016, when I started pushing towards wanting to get it made, I was pushing every day. I was doing things every day to push this project forward and to inch whatever I could, whatever I, you know, whatever I thought could bring it closer to being made. Can you talk a little bit about what some of those things are that you were doing every day, like starting back in 2016? Are you like emailing producers? Are you like doing table reads? Like what are are some of the things you're doing in order to like, you know, get the film closer to being shot? So definitely work on the script and research, you know, continuous really just working, working on getting a different people to read so that I could get feedback so that I could make the script better. So definitely that whole side that had to do with the script, characters, research, and just keep developing that on the production side would be, you know, to talk to people 
that I knew, who maybe they knew, who maybe would be willing to read, and also what avenues there might be to get something to cast. Or so that that was continuous. Yeah, emailing, talking to, but I. <sighs> I don't think, I, I mean, I wouldn't just email people randomly. It would be if I had spoken with somebody and they, we had a conversation about trafficking and I brought up that I, you know, had written this movie, then I sent it to them. Or if I met someone in the industry or someone who I thought, wow, that, that person really has a good mind for story. Or we had a great conversation about character and what makes characters interesting. And then I would send them the script to read because I wanted their feedback. But then, you know, so, so it was always just doing whatever I could to make the project better and better because I really do believe that if something is good, then people notice it eventually. And I'm not someone who has, I wasn't born with any contacts in the industry whatsoever. For me, it was a lot about making sure that the material was ready and that me as a director, that I knew more and more and more and more about how to do it, but also that I knew that I knew the environment of the movie and the issues of the movie so well that my competence couldn't be questioned because ultimately, you know, in different, at different stages, when it was, when it would be challenged, whether I was good enough to direct this movie, especially because the budget couldn't be ultra, ultra low, then it was really my depth of research and my knowledge about the thematic and female truckers and the trucking industry that I, everything I knew there that made them really feel confident that I was the best director for this, even though I hadn't directed a feature before. So that's kind of what sold it in to the people who who we couldn't show, you know, a former feature to. Are you speaking mainly of financiers or are you speaking of cast when you're in terms of proving your ability? Both, I think. I know that for the producer, that was, you know, for the producer, Claudia Bloomhuber, who's, who's the lead producer. I mean, she always supported me in directing it, but obviously it was, it, it was something that she always had to battle when she spoke with investors and distributors, et cetera, naturally. Like, I, I understand that. It, it makes absolute sense. I hadn't proven myself, you know? So, but then I, I know that for her, for her, it was essential to show that I had all of this knowledge that nobody else had, not even someone, you know, if one could have brought in someone who was much more experienced as a director, they still wouldn't have that competence that I had about the subject matter and about the trucking industry and especially female truckers. And then, uh, but, but also for the actors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for Juliet, once she had read and, and really became interested because of the script and the character, when I then met with her, I know that, I mean, that's what made her gain respect for me is that she realized how deep into the material I was because she had nothing either to make her know. And she, she hasn't very often worked with first time directors. She hasn't had to, you know, and why, and why would she? The script, you know, did its job, but, but then in meeting me, um, she has told me that it's because she realized that I really, really knew what I was making a film about. I want to go back to something that you said earlier when you were, you know, had a script and people were, you know, encouraging you to sell it rather than because you would never get a chance to direct it yourself because of because of the, you know, the budget and everything. What were some of the offers that you were getting? Was it like $50,000 for the script, $100,000 more or less than that? It didn't come to the stage of getting a getting a number value on that because mm. I decided in advance of that, I decided that I was not interested in going down that route. Okay. And then leading up to that, like, did you have representation, you know, at this point, like who are fielding these offers for you or part of this process? Or did that kind of come later after you started to make the movie? Yeah, no, I, I actually was, I actually did have agents and his, my agent who, who is now my manager because he moved over from, he was at APA when he took me in as, as an agent. And then now he's a manager at Grandview. So I'm still with him now at Grandview. And then how did that come about? You know, since you hadn't, you know, directed a feature or anything, was it mm. through a short you made or 
how were you able to like, secure management at that stage in your career? It was actually because of the script. So I started writing the script at while I was still in grad school at Columbia. And, and the script ended up winning a prize, the Zachy Gordon Mem- Memorial Award for Excellence in Screenwriting. And it was wonderful to get that award for one. But what it did is it, it gave me some meetings with some agents and managers. So that's when they picked me up. But it was quite, I mean, they were, they were brave. And I really appreciate my now manager for that because I was like eight months pregnant when I had those meetings. <laughs> so I think it's pretty awesome that they picked me up. Yeah. So it was all, it was just because of the script, actually, that they took me on. I want to hear about the theater that you did and working yeah. on Boardwalk Empire. And what does it mean to consult on that show? And it, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can start a little bit with the theater. So I did theater since, I mean, since I was a kid, kind of, I was just obsessed with telling stories. So I would like, whenever there was a, like a theater thing at my elementary school, I would just like jump in and want to do it. And nobody else really wanted to do the big parts. So I ended up playing all of the male parts because obviously it's usually the male parts that are the biggest parts, right? So. <laughs> So I, I, I kind of always just jumped into that. And then I continued with that into, into adulthood. And then I did a lot of theater in New York. And I, in, in, in New York, I ended up kind of 50-50 producing and directing because I, I produced a lot of European plays had their like US premieres in in New York. And then you asked about Boardwalk Empire. So that was that was because there was a Norwegian character on Boardwalk Empire for a while. Christiana Seidel played this nanny on on Boardwalk Empire. That was like a nanny from Norway. And they so they needed a consultant on there to deal with everything with her. And it was actually amazing because I got to sit right behind the director and the script supervisor while I was on while I was on when I was on the show. So I learned a lot. And I think it's one of the things that also then made me get even closer to wanting to to get into directing in that way. And then how did that opportunity come about? Was that also just through your your managers or through your agent? No, no, that was that was literally just because this this actress who was going to play this part, she she managed to track me down somehow. She managed to she, she tracked me down because she had heard about me through the New York theater scene, I think. Yeah, that's what it was because I'd been doing a couple of like Norwegian plays in translation and stuff like that. So she read about me or heard about me from somebody and she just called me up and kind of asked if I could. So she kind of hired me in, but then the the um, the production also hired me in to come in for them. And then just to switch gears really quick, like how did this Home yeah. for Christmas directing opportunity happen? Was that like before you shot Paradise Highway or yeah. after or how did that all go? How did that all go? So I guess I can thank that also for like my time in theater because this Home for Christmas was a Norwegian Netflix production. So back when I did a lot of theater in New York, I, like I said, I did these like European plays in the US debuts. So people back in Europe kind of knew what I was up to. This director who used to be a theater director then contacted me and wanted some advice because he had a show that was going to come up in New York. I got in touch with him then. So then after I had graduated from Columbia and I wanted to, as I was trying to push Paradise Highway and I wanted to kind of get going, obviously I needed to earn money and I needed to to work. I contacted him and I, I just said, you know, listen, if you ever have a production, he usually directs entire seasons of TV and he's very prolific in Europe. So I just said, you know, if you ever have a production where you, for some reason, don't have the time to direct the entire the entire season, and if you feel like it would be good for you to have someone come in and just do a section of it, I would love to come in and learn because I'm, you, you know, you're from theater, went over to, into TV, and I'm really interested in making the same transition. And then it was a lot of luck because then he, I sent him my shorts and he liked my shorts. He was very kind of, you know, impressed and he liked them. And then just a couple of weeks after he had seen my shorts, Netflix had very suddenly greenlit this production. And they were going into production five weeks after it was greenlit. Yeah, so he had some earlier commitments that he had to take care of. So he needed someone to come in and do a third of, of the season. So it, it was it was a lot of luck and good timing, I guess. 
And it was lucky for me that he liked the short films that I sent him. You spent 10 years with this as your top, with Paradise Highway as your top priority, you know, trying to push it forward every single day. Yeah. I'm curious about the level of, you know, I I don't want to presume, but potential emotional satisfaction that you may be experiencing (laughs) right now. (laughs) Do you feel happy? Like, are you, tell us what it feels like. Yeah, I feel, I feel very happy. You know, I feel, and, and, and yeah, I feel very happy. And I, I, I felt like happy in like bursts. I was super happy while we were shooting too, even though, as you know, always with shoots, there is a million things happen and you, and it takes, you know, you, you work 24 seven, but I was, uh, it was so joyful to finally be on set and, and seeing the movie come to life, you know, and the same during the editing. I mean, during the entire process, I just felt so incredibly lucky and, I just felt so kind of overjoyed by the fact that it was happening. And now when it's finished, yeah, it's it's super joyful. And, you know, obviously I hope it will really be received well. And someone asked me the other day, we're like, oh my God, you got to be, you must be really nervous. And I realized I was like, I wasn't even nervous because I think I was just so relieved that it was finally happening that I, I, I felt like I don't have the right to be nervous about how it's going to be received because I'm just really happy that the film actually actually is going to be out there. So one of the things that filmmakers constantly like bang their head against the wall over is finding producers for their films. So can you just tell us the story of how you're able to secure and find the producers who joined you on Paradise Highway? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because it's it's, it's a complete cliche. Let me warn you with that in advance, because I... <laughs> I had made a short film called A Lucky Man and I I put that in the in the film in like the short film market the short film corner is called in you know at the at the Cannes Film Festival and obviously that whole short film corner is you know hundreds of short films and and it's very hard I think to really get results out of it but the reason why I wanted to do it was also because I'd never been at Cannes and I'm entering into the film industry and I felt like I need to kind of know what Cannes is so I I decided to put it in the short film corner. And then with the producer I had on a different short film, we kind of went together. And then she managed to get us into this one party for this company called Silver Reel on their yacht, you know, as <laughs> many parties are in God, which this is where the cliche comes in. And then my, my then, you know, my friend, this, this uh, all fellow Columbia producer, she, she introduced me then. And she, she is also someone who hasn't been, she, she hasn't been brought up with any contacts in the industry, but she's a very hardworking person. And so she's, she had gotten us into this party and then she introduced me to the CEO and the head of the company, Claudia. And, and she said, you know, she was like, well, you know, we're, we've actually been trying to find something that deals with trafficking. Why don't you send us the script? So then at, you know, 1 a.m. when I came home after driving for an hour and 15 minutes up to this like apartment that I had borrowed from a friend of a friend up in the mountains. When I came home at 1 a.m., I sent along the script because I thought, okay, if I don't send it now, I'm just going to forget about it. So I sent it along. And then at like noon the next day, I received an email back saying, we love your script. Can you come back to the yacht tonight at 9.30 p.m.? (laughs) Wow. And yeah, so I, so I did. So I did. And then uh, I met with some more people then. And then they said, can you come back again tomorrow morning? Because there's more people you wanted to meet. And then I did. But I mean, it, it, you know, it feels like a complete cliche. But the truth is that, you know, Claudia really is someone who cares about making movies that have meaning. And I guess by then I had worked on the script for so many years that it really felt like it was solid to them. So then we started. But I mean, you know, from there, it still took three years before we were able to get it up. And it's not like getting them on board is alone what made it happen. But she, Claudia and her team really turned out to be the right team for making this film happen. You know, both her and Georgia Bailiff, who's also at Silver Reel, who, who they've, they managed to make this film happen. And it's 
kind of incredible. Wow. It's like such a fairy tale story. I know, like, well, it's we, crazy. We, all, <laughs> we all want from going to a festival or some big event is to be whisked away to some party on a yacht and <laughs> yeah. meet the producer of our dreams and they welcome us back the next day to, to pitch yeah. our movie more. It's like, what an amazing story. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's really funny. I find it super funny, but it's, but, but of course it's like, you know, at that moment then, you know, when they called me back there, I was also thinking, okay, well, it's been worth, it was the right thing to do to work on the script as much as I've had, as I've done these six years. Because if they had opened the script and it wasn't good, they wouldn't have called me. So yeah, yeah you got to have a ton of luck, which I did. But that luck wouldn't have counted for anything if I hadn't put in the work. Yeah, it's so funny because I always like, you know, when people say, oh, I got into the Cannes short film corner or whatever. I'm always like, eh, everyone got, I got into that. I just didn't go. But it's like, wow, maybe I should have gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for, for, for my short film, though, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't come much out of it. And I wasn't expecting it to either. You know, it was really right. more to kind of experience the festival and, and just start to orient myself in the industry because I really didn't have any experience with the industry. Yeah. I had another question, but I got to I gotta ask this instead. So like, you know, once your producers did get on board, mm. like what were com- some of the things that you did with them to, to get the movie off the ground? Was it just like, you know, you, you going on meetings, you doing more and more pitches? Like, did you have to at that point prove that you were still the right person to direct the movie? Or was it when they were on board, it was kind of like, you're good to go and it's all set? No, I mean, I I knew that I had to prove myself continuously until the movie was done, (laughs) which is the truth. But I was clear with them from the beginning. I said, I just want you to know that there is no way this film is happening without me directing it. And I I just want to be clear so that you know. And and, I mean, Claudia was very supportive of that the whole time. And obviously, in a way, it made it easier for her because whenever distributors or investors would try to push it, she could just tell them very directly that I wouldn't let the script be done with anyone else. But yeah, I mean, there, there was, there was still, we, I mean, we then started rounds of revisions and uh, with that first summer did one big round of revisions. And then we did a table reading at APA actually. And that my friend, Carrie Barden helped me kind of put together the cast for, and then there were more revisions. Like, so there were still rounds of revisions with them after that. And then, you know, sending out to potential casts, trying to find routes. And, but it wasn't until my cinematographer who had worked with Juliet 10 years earlier wasn't until he sent it to her that then things became more more concrete. I think it's time for our final six questions. So these are the ones we alluded mm-hmm. to at, at, at the top of the show. Uh-huh. Okay. What's the first film you ever made? It could be short. It could be Paradise Highway, whatever. However you interpret it. What's the first film you ever made and how do you feel about it now? The first film I ever made was The Kangaroo, which was a short film that I made when I I had started directing in theater. And then I realized, because I always knew I would be a director once I grew up, as I used to say. But as I started directing more in theater, I realized that theater was not the right medium for me as a director. So then I put together what I knew of friends and family, etc., to help me make a short. And that film was called The Kangaroo. And actually, I, I still quite like it. I mean, it has, it's not perfect in any way, but I, I like it. I just, I watched it just a couple of months ago and I was like, oh yeah, that was that film. What's the best filmmaking advice you've ever received? I mean, the, the best advice I ever received, like, I think probably to be prepared. I mean, to prepare and to listen. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Worst advice. (laughs) The worst advice? Yeah. Or just bad advice that someone they've witnessed. You know, I yeah, I, I have had a couple of people talk about how it's important to manipulate actors and that's just not something I do at all and it's not something I believe in. It's actually really something I really do not believe in. So that I think is terrible advice. Mm. But I guess it was also pretty bad advice with the person who told me that, well, if your budget is going to be over two million, then there's no way you're going to direct this movie. I guess that was bad advice too. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have a goal as a filmmaker? Yeah. 
I I would like to contribute with some stories that share some undertold or underexposed characters and issues and situations maybe help us see things that that we didn't really notice before if you could go back in time what's the piece of advice you would give yourself I don't know, you know, like I want to say, was it worth, you know, maybe it's not worth having so many sleepless nights over 10 years. <laughs> you know, maybe you should hold off on the sleepless nights until like the end. <laughs> on the other hand, I, I mean, that was part of what also made it happen, right? Was kind of that being so obsessive <laughs> about something that ultimately made it happen. And then the last question is making movies hard. Yeah, but it's also so joyful, though. Like, I, I, yeah, it is really, really hard. I mean, I, I wish that I could, like, love to be an accountant or a doctor or that there was something else that I really loved doing, but it's not. And I just really, really love my job. So, yeah, it is really hard, but that's also part of why I love it is because it's challenging because we love being challenged, right? I mean, that's, but I, I would love for it to be a little less hard. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> How can people best support you and see the movie? How they can best support me and see the movie? Yes, they like, can uh, do both. well, <laughs> but uh, for them to do both. any call to action you have, please share. I mean, I would love for people to take the opportunity to see this movie in the theaters because it's actually coming in select theaters. And that's amazing for an indie film. It's so unusual now that indie films get to play in theaters. And it is, it's a movie that has stunning cinematography on top of being like great characters and, and entertaining and having all of this, you know, 18 wheelers like on the road with female truck drivers. You want to see that. And Juliette Binoche, you want to see that on the big screen. And like Morgan Freeman and Cameron Monaghan, you want to see them like cruising down the road together. You want to see that on the big screen. So that's, I, I'd love for people to take the opportunity to see, the, see it on the big, big screen. But if you can't, then, you know, watch it on your iPad or your phone <laughs> oh. <laughs> or, your, or your home screen. It's, it's going to... It's a movie that survives well on any size screen. But if you have the opportunity, then go and see it in the theater. Is it? Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. And let's remember that the movie comes out on the 29th of July. Ulrich, what do you remember about our conversation with Anna? Oh, she was just lovely. Like a lovely human. And just, I could probably... It's like somebody I would want to have tea with and like talk to for hours about filmmaking and art and things because she was so interesting, so engaging. I really loved her approach to her filmmaking and that like it was like this huge important endeavor that it's it's not like she just poops out a draft. She's like, oh, here's a script. It's like she researches it. She lives it. She meets these people. She gets to know about what she's writing about. And she like gets super deep into the characters. Like it's like a part of her life, you know, and Talia. Uh, <gasps> I thought about the same way. Talia Lagasse, yeah. my favorite guest. Yeah. She was the same, like the yes. way that she got super embedded with her, her, you know, the subject subjects of her movie, you know, that like, like the content, she was like a part of their organization and stuff and was like, you know, part of the community. It's like the same sort of approach. And I think it's really wonderful and amazing. And just to hear that, like, you can get to this kind of level of filmmaking, um, and and not have it have to be like make a low budget feature and then make a bigger budget feature bigger budget feature you can just get to the top no matter what people tell you and people told her that she couldn't she, people told her that she can't make this movie as her first feature because it's just too big too big budget or whatever but she did it anyways and she made it happen and I just thought it was a really interesting story about how like these things can happen these things do happen and like her whole con story was just <laughs> with the yacht <laughs> yeah the yacht yeah it was it was nice so I don't know. I just, I really liked the conversation and I just thought that, you know, it was a really in-depth conversation about the nuts and bolts of how this movie became a movie in a way that like we don't always get those nitty gritty details. Yeah. It was a great counterpoint to the advice that actually I give all the time, which I shouldn't give all the time, right? It's like, it's kind of like the Rebecca S. Grace story too. I always urge filmmakers to make the movie as soon as
soon as possible, make it with the resources that they have, because we need to get better and better as craftspeople. We need the practice, yada, yada, yada. There's also a story that my former boss used to tell about Sean Baker. Sean Baker, which, have I mentioned this before? I don't know. Sean Baker, you know, director extraordinaire, was talking to a fellow filmmaker, and uh, the fellow filmmaker was like, well, I need... $5 million to make my movie. And Sean Baker's like, oh, okay, well, that's a lot of money. And then 10, 10 years later, Sean Baker talks to this filmmaker and they still hasn't made, have his, haven't made their movie yet, but Sean Baker's made like three features in, the, in that time and his career has really blossomed. And that story is always to prove the point of like, don't wait, start now, make the movie with the resources you have. But people like Rebecca S. Grace and Anna Gateau, it's like they're proving the alternate. Like they are making the movie for the resources that that movie needed. And we always forget about that. We always say like, no, 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 you can make it for less. But I loved her conviction. Her story will help encourage me to stop pushing the narrative of exploitation filmmaking, right? Because that's essentially what we're urging is like exploiting labor and resources over and over again. Kind of. I don't think that's necessarily <laughs> Not always. That the, That's like the negative aspect yeah, of what I encourage. I think we're encouraging to make your movie and we're hoping that you do it responsibly and then people yeah. decide to do it responsibly or irresponsibly, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I still think like I'm more in the in the Sean Baker camp, you know, that like it's better to just make something than to dream about making something for forever, you know, but but I don't think the, I think the difference is with Rebecca and Anna is that they didn't just dream about it. They didn't just like, you know, say they need this money and like whatever. It's like they, they worked every day yeah. to make it happen. Like they made it their top priority for, you know, many, many, many years of their lives. Like in Anna's case, like 10 years, like this was her thing that she was working on as much as she could staying up all night trying to make the script better trying to you know get it to the right person trying to meet more people to send it to like all these things that's like you know one one day of it or one email of it doesn't add up to anything but like five years of like really pushing this movie out into the world and like really making it the thing that you do talk about live breathe everything it's like what we're seeing coming out on you know in a week is this is this is the result of that so it's incredible it's really cool and you know i don't think that like by making a movie the way that we've made our movies makes it that we can't do this for our next movie or whatever that we well we should have done this like oh the alternate should have been this thing where we spent more money whatever it's like no like that's the way this movie had to get made and the next movie will get made the way that that next movie has to get made you know and i don't think that that really it doesn't take away from any other approach it's just You're really totally beautiful right. to see that hers worked well. No, you're yeah. totally right. And it's a case by case basis. I also think there's something really magical about the vagueness of the process. It's like you asked her, you were like, what, what did you do? Like, what did you do every day? And it was that like, I met people, I sent it out, I worked on the script, but there's still no path. There's no path to make <laughs> low budget film. There's no path to make a big budget film. It's equally obfuscated by this very labyrinth like industry. And it's just funny that it's like, it really is pounding the pavements and then something someday will break. Yeah. Milan Chakraborty, who was on the show months ago, has this image he shares every year. And it's a picture of like a guy in a tunnel with a pickaxe trying to like reach, I don't know, the end of the tunnel. And then it's from his point of view, um, the guy with the pickaxe, and he gives up. And then it's from the bird's eye view, which is the pickaxe, pickaxe was just about to break through to the end of the tunnel. Right, right. right. And it's like, you have no idea where the next big break is going to come. And it really is just this vague process of like, will you read my scripts? Who do you know? Let's go to Cannes. <laughs> let's, let's go to Cinequest, whatever it is, to meet the right people to make it happen, which I think will tie into our conversation later. But I'll, I'll, st- I'll curb myself a little bit. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> So we have an article this week from IndieWire writer Tom Brueggemann about how older women audiences came out to watch Where the Crawdads Sing and Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris this last weekend. Crawdads took the number three spot with 17 million underneath Thor and Minions, the Minions movie, whatever that is, you know, at 46 million and 26 million. But like in the article, this is the thing that cracks me up. So Tom says that Sony spent about 24 million on Crawdads. I go to IMDb Pro, it says $44 million dollars on crowd ads which which is a lot more than 24 million tom 
So if those, that number is accurate, that's 44 million. 17 million doesn't really seem like that earth shaking <laughs> towards a $44 million budget. You know, even if that is the movie and the, the marketing together or, or whatever, it's still like, yeah, just like kind of, you know, it's not even half, you know, it's still cool to be number three. But I just, I basically feel like, is this really proving anything, you know, that huge? Like, I mean, it's not like it was, I don't know, I guess 17 million. Is that a lot in box office numbers these days? I guess it is. Like, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Sure, you know, does it, does it just mean that there's not that many people going to the movies? Like, I, I don't, I don't know what what really we should take away from this. The thing that I really took away from reading this article is like, why in God's name would you spend forty four million dollars on this movie? Because I was looking at the credits, there's no like humongous stars. It's not like you know Nicole Kidman or you know Angelina Jolie or somebody is like the in this movie. It's like you know the good actors and like you know maybe they've been in some stuff or whatever, but like they're not like humongous a listers. So that you know they didn't drop like half the budget on the stars so i'm wondering where the hell this money went to in this movie and like like who decides to make a 44 million dollar feel good movie aimed at older audiences like what what is happening here oh i don't think it's a feel good movie that's not feel good I mean, isn't it a true crime? Isn't it kind of like a mystery type? Is it? It it does have to do with crime because I know that like the author and her family has some sort of like tie in to the storyline in the book. Like they were like, there are too many weird parallels between her life and the movie that that we can ignore. Oh, I just think I thought I don't know if it was a, if it was a crime movie. Why is it aimed at older women? I guess I don't know because like because we like crime, like crime movies too. Doesn't everybody like crime movies though? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's interesting that they like. How do they know? How does how does the data know that the older women are watching this movie specifically? Right? Is it the credit card? receipts like are they surveying old ladies as they leave the theater like why did you come to see ethel i don't know <laughs> <laughs> ethel oh my god but i do think that you know women audiences are often ignored and especially older women i would say are pretty marginalized and i love that there's a counterpoint to the cynicisms of the cynicism of drama in in the theatrical marketplace even though this has like crime and mystery associated with it it's still a drama right it's not a tentpole yeah. action film and of course it has like the tie to the ip with the best-selling novel and reese witherspoon's company produced it so like that's a lot of resources aiming towards it and its success but i just love hearing stories where it's like something cracks the top 10 that's not a superhero movie so congratulations where the crawdad sing yeah verified mystery movie yeah i, I, I don't know why i guess this the move <laughs> the day the title and the article together made me think it was a different type of movie than it was yeah. so, you know why it's worth doing research but yeah i don't know i mean i just think about when i go to like the the, the art house movie theater like at three o'clock you know on a weekday and the amount of old people that are there it's like old people come out to movies in droves man like they are on not be it right that's yeah. that's because that's all they they don't have much else to do you know they're gonna go to movies <laughs> you know like, they go to their their macrame classes or whatever i mean and come then, on you know, think of how ideal of a lifestyle that is to go hey man, and see movies every day, a retired lifestyle. When I'm old, I'm going to be in the movie theater every day. Every I'll day. tell you. Every, every day. single day. And why wouldn't I be? It's the greatest place to be. Yeah. Anyways, no, I, I mean, but yeah, so I feel like older audiences going to the theater isn't like a shocking re- like revelation to me. It's like, yes, they do go. I mean, I've seen them with my eyeballs. Like, it's definitely, you know, whatever. But anyways. But it's, that fam- it's that family audiences that you get, you know, you get the two kids, the popcorn and the soda. Yeah. You know, it's like the... Yeah. I understand the targeting of 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 the youth, but maybe, but I, I'm thinking of the counter examples, like you know, the 400 foot journey or Marigold Hotel, whatever Marigold, something Marigold, oh, the great yeah. exotic Marigold mm-hmm. Hotel. Like right. there are some great examples of box office favorites that we should be going towards. Like yeah, we should be financing more movies, more dramas, more dramas. Yeah, Under the Tuscan Sun three. You uh, know, let's, let's make it I happen. missed two, but I will see three as well. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyways, just to move on to this other topic. Yeah. So, as I mentioned earlier, I've been watching Resident Evil and, uh, you know, I kept, came up on to episode five and, uh, you know, your friend Rachel Goldberg, who we've talked off my, camera My acquaintance. About. Your <laughs> my acquaintance. Rachel Goldberg. We, we were trying to get her on the show. Let's just put it, be honest. Yeah. She was, try- was going to be on the show. She- scheduling whatever i think it was actually scheduling going to shoot resident evil that kept her off the show 
<laughs> but anyways, so her name popped up, and then another person I recognize's name popped up, Lindsay uh, Villarreal. Villa, I know Lindsay Villarreal. pretty well, too. So you know Lindsay. I, I couldn't even say I know Lindsay. I just can say I met her. Well, she went to USC around the same time. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we, we went. I was at, we were at a film film festival where both our movies played uh, in 2014. So I met oh. her. You know, we, we were at the award show together, like you know, sitting at the same table, whatever. And so, like you know, we didn't really stay in touch or anything, but I just recognized the name. You know, when when it popped up. But I was just it just made me think. It's like, well, so you know, like what is happening here? So it's like, how do you get your your how do you get to be in the game to be up for these opportunities? You know, that that's like the main question. And I know, like Lindsay was like working on set like as an assistant and like doing all kinds of things like you know like in the world of of like entertainment shows like she was on sets part of shows and I looked up her IMDb and she kind of like seems like she worked her way up you know like going from you know this kind of assistant role to this assistant role and eventually getting in a writer's room and then she's yeah she's a writer yeah yeah exactly and so then making her way from you know being like a PA to like being a writer on shows such as Resident Evil and other things so it's like maybe that's like the way that it, that it happens happens you know like is is that what we should all be doing like should we all just be going you know to los angeles or our, wherever we can where people are making movies and like becoming assistants and working our way up is it making a great movie and being discovered is it all those things like you know i know to some degree it's like you can't really control like your life and like how you're gonna end up where you want to be but like i just like just seeing these name this name of someone that i you know was like basically like in the similar you know both our movies played at the same level film festival you know like we were kind of the same even you know kind of whatever she she was already doing things in LA I was doing things in the Bay Area like whatever but it's like we're kind of like at the same level and then you look like you know whatever eight years later and uh, yeah she's like skyrocketed <laughs> off with her career and it's like well you know what does she do that I didn't do in order for her to get to the, the place is it just like or is it just we all have our own paths and our own journeys like should she I be just changing got a promotion. my approach she got a promotion at her job. That's what it is. It's right. an eight years like, to, of promotions. Like, but I think right. you're comparing apples to oranges, right? Because it's like you're talking about the movies you made and then you're talking about her day job compared to your mm. day job, which is completely, mm. those are two different things. Whereas like if she were making another independent feature right now that took off in a certain way, then I would kind mm. of be like, well, yeah, right. let's examine the decisions that took you one place and her decisions that are different. Right. So she basically had a better day job than I did. Is well, she did <laughs> well, a, a more aligned with the, aligned, uh, the industry. Yeah. But, yeah. You, but you don't necessarily, I mean, I know you've talked about maybe wanting to work in the writer's room in terms of development and creative input on story. Right. right. But you haven't expressed this keen desire to want to be a writer full time. But and I think the conversations that we've had on this show, you know, there does seem to be a path in television that is clear or a lot clearer than narrative filmmaking. Mm -hmm. It's like right. independent filmmaking is a startup every single time. You have to start from the ground up every single time, right? Like you may have more relationships, you may have better connections to investors, connections to cast, but you still have to create a company every single time you do an independent feature. Whereas if you're a writer on a TV show, you join an organization already formulated, already structured. Like that right. saves a lot of time and energy, I think. But I think the core of what your question is like, how have great opportunities come to us? Like how, mm -hmm. right? Is that what you're asking? I, I guess. I don't know. This is sort of a loosely formed concept that I just was like throwing out into the world. It's like, I, I guess the bottom line is like, yeah, it's back to that same question we've talked about before. It's like, am I doing the things that I need to do in order to get to where I want to go? Or am I just doing something that is not going to have the net result of, or can't have the net result of, of the career I want? You know, and I'm not saying I want to be a writer, a staff writer in Resident Evil. You know, that's, that's not what I'm looking for in my life. But like, I do, like, I love that. That's a really cool show. And like, I want to be making things like at that level one day. But like, you know, by making indie movies, like, is that, is that like going to gear up to that one day? Or is it more like, am I playing the lottery game? Like, oh, if I make enough of these indie films, like maybe I'll, you know, get a chance to like, you know, work on something, you know, on a higher level or, or what? Or am I, I don't know. Or what is, what is, like, where's my place in the world, Liz? I guess that's the real question. Like, how do I fit into this? 
Do well, I even fit into this world of Hollywood, or am I just I, I got like a bystander on the sidelines? I guess that's what I'm really getting at. You know, yeah, you have to ask your, ask yourself: Do you want? the attention of the establishment. And if you do, you need to go and cater your career to get their attention. Right. And that means casting name actors. And that means working with agencies. And that means finding representation. I mean, there's like a very clear direction. It may not be like a guaranteed path that you get to be on, but there's at least a direction for you to go to if you want the system to pay attention to you. But you seem to also want not that. You want to just make the movies you want to make and keep on making content and help filmmakers around you. I mean, like, if you really want advice, I'm not calling it unsolicited because you did solicit it. Oh, yeah. So if you want it, I mean, I think you need to say no to a lot more things. <laughs> I think you need to, like, give yourself free time for, like, a few weeks to really think about what you want to do and stop distracting yourself with other people's projects is what I think that that may help incrementally but will not help in a big way like they're they're small wonderful gestures that you're that you do to help the filmmaking community but I would I would downsize on those for a little bit to give yourself time so don't air edit Eric Parnell's movie or the next version of editing I actually Eric am Parnell's okay movie. with Eric Parnell <laughs> thing because you get to be creative right like right, that, right. that's rewarding it's more like the onlining of Mitch Altieri's so, film. So I say fuck Mitch is what you're trying you to tell You finish me. it, but don't <laughs> say yes to another gig like that, I think. I, I don't think know. Because I could see why you did it. You wanted to help Jeff. You wanted to help Mitch. You want to stay connected to other filmmakers. But people are not going to forget you if you say no. They're going to, mm. they're still going to remember you. They're still going to want to yeah. work with you, even if you say no. True. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I just feel like, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. I should do things more for me, you <laughs> me know, too. and less for, and less for other people. I, I don't know. I guess like just talking this out loud, you know, like I, I don't really want to be the director floating from show to show, you know, like, like I, I, we've had a lot of guests like that. I've talked to those people. Like it, it sounds like a really cool thing to like be able to work on this show here, work on this show there, like constantly have your life in flux. But like with a kid, it's not necessarily an ideal situation, you know, like I want to be around where my, my daughter is, you know? Yeah. And so like making um, like what, like a movie, you know, like, like this job that I'm up for that I'm like waiting to hear back. Like if this happens, like that would be really cool. Cause I could probably bring my family with me while we make it, you know, and like, I wouldn't have to, be, I mean, I would obviously have a lot less time with them because I'd be making a movie, but like, at least I would be able to have, be, have them be close, you know? Yeah. And I don't really feel like that's necessarily the same situation with a TV show necessarily. Like, it's not really practical to be moving your, your family around for like, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks at a time or whatever, you know, from one place to another place for another place. But if you do it for just like, well... You can make your own life. They can be, they're That's resilient. True. They can adapt, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't know about your well, wife and her job, but I mean, little little kids can, can adapt as long as you're like uh, nice to them and kind and loving and feeding them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Like we weren't born with the expectation of a nine to five job for the rest of our lives. Like we instituted right. that as a culture. So like, I don't think the, like your, the soul of your child has to have a level of stability that we're talking about. Yeah. I don't know. I guess, I guess this is just like a really weird off the wall conversation about like, you know, what, like what you, what you want and what you, and what your expectations are for that to have the thing that you want. And like, are you doing the things that you need to do to get what you want? Mm -hmm. You know? And I feel like if I wanted to be a TV director, I'm obviously not doing the right things to be a TV director. Or if I wanted to be in a writer's room, I'm like not doing the right things to get into a writer's room. Right. But like, if I want to make more movies and like be an independent filmmaker, like I, I think I am doing the right things right. for that life, you know? So I don't know. I feel like for now it's like stay the course. You know, but like, do you have these thoughts at all, Liz? Like, or, or are you like completely so solid no, in your understanding of where you are in your career? Like, no, like how you fit lost. into this world? <laughs> always lost, always confused. I do think though, and I've talked about this before, I think I have a really good network and I think it came from USC and Sundance and it has brought my ability to bring guests on the show. It has brought my ability to get considered for gigs. Like I remember my first job, they were like, you went to USC film school, you're in. Like it was literally like you're like, it, it's nepotism, right? So for me, I was thinking of your question before we started recording and it's every opportunity I've had came through a relationship 
a relationship or an organization mm-hmm. I was a part of. As we talk about over and over, there's no meritocracy. There's no, nothing is merit-based. Everything is nepotism. So <laughs> the, it, it's horrible, but it's true. But I think even being on this podcast, it's like, I was watching Joe Bob last night with Sean and Larry Fessenden was on the show. And I was oh, like, cool. I was like, I think I have Larry Fessenden's email address still. And we talked to him on this show. And it's like, that's networking. It's like we get to meet really cool people who could maybe mentor us in our careers yeah. if they feel comfortable because of something like this or because of the organizations we're a part of. I'm just saying time is precious. And if you're doing work that isn't paying you really well and isn't helping your career in a meaningful way, start thinking about saying no to it. And I... I've gotten farther saying no to things lately than saying yes to things. Mm, interesting. Good thing to think about. Yeah. You know, that sometimes the no opens up the door for the better yes. I think Felicia Pride talked about that. Like, you know, sometimes you're rejected by an opportunity because a better opportunity is around the corner. But I think the reverse could also mean something too. Sometimes you say no to something to save room for something else. Yeah. Well, if you have something that you've been thinking about in your brain that's been causing you trauma, you know, that's related to the uh, filmmaking world or your place in it, you can always send us a question, comment, or suggestion to podcast at makingmoviesheart.com. And uh, we'll talk about it on the show and we'll, you know, maybe make you feel less alone in your freaking outness of uh, what's going on with your, your filmmaking. Or if you really, really like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes. We haven't gotten one of those in a little while. It'd be nice to have another review on iTunes. ITunes. So if uh, you're a new listener, you're just hearing this and you're saying, yeah, I will subscribe to this show. Give us a review. That would be very nice. Thank you very much in advance. Um, you should also check out the International Screenwriters Association, the ISA. They're a wonderful organization that's designed to connect writers with filmmakers through a number of programs they offer, including publishing your logline to a network of industry professionals, consultation courses, contests, and of course, their top 25 writers list featuring some of their best writers. So head over to www.networkisa.org to sign up for free today. Thanks to Ana Gato for coming on the show and to Sam Anaya from Katrina One PR for setting it all up. Thanks to our editor Jeff Vrymoot for doing the editing and, and as always thanks to our producer Eric Toms for simply being awesome. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you all next week. Don't <laughs> This is so silly. I feel like I'm a corporate shell.